one of my biggest influences uh, as a band and also the guitar player from that band is Rush. And it's probably, if I had a name like my favorite band, it would, it would be them. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the things that I really picked up from Alex are how to make the guitar sound really, really big. And uh, obviously Rush is a trio, and I, I use that a lot, I'm finding now, when I play um, solo, when it's just me and, and bass and drums, I'm able to take that knowledge and, and make the trio sound, sound big. Um, some of the things I learned from him are just the, to make the chords bigger, add ninths to it, and try to use all the strings. Playing a C. Instead of doing it that way, I'll add the nine on top. Play the fifth below. So whenever I go to that chord, I have the whole thing. In Metropolis, it's... So that, that's a big part of my playing mm -hmm. style. And I'll do that with, uh, you know, anytime I can use some sort of open strings in the chord or ninths, I'll use it. If I'm playing a G <laughs> or an F, I'll go D. So I'll put that fifth below a lot, and I'll try to have some sort of open string in there. And the other thing from Alex is kind of like using open strings as pedal notes as well as the chords are changing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll do things like... So that B kind of has that... that uh, that pedal tone makes it, right. I don't know, it's a little more ominous sounding. Right. And that's a big rush sound. Right. It makes the guitar part, part certainly more interesting. And it helps to make this, the sound bigger, right. I think, as well. Um, and of, of course, if you add chorusing and delay, then it's even, you know, it's like your guitar sounds like a house <laughs> when you do that. And if you have those open strings. <laughs> a big part of it too. There's also another thing from Alex, the, the way that uh, in Rush, the way they do these kind of unison, almost bluesy riffs, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we have that a lot, like, um, for example, in, in Sacrifice Sons, there's some of that going on. Uh, the riff goes like, one, two, three, four. <laughs> do those lines where the whole band you know are, are doubling that and it sounds really thick and you know I just kind of re remember some of the Rush songs from like the earlier albums the first right. album and where they have this you know here it is slow one two three four Six five five three three. So it's like one, two, three, four. thing about the odd times and stuff like that is um, to me I, I kind of feel I feel the riff going by and and uh, and the, the melody within the riff right. 
as far as counting it, um, that can change at any given time, depending on how Mike is phrasing the part. Right. So I don't concern myself so much with how, like the breakdown of how I'm feeling it. I sure. concern myself with where the melody lies within yeah. the riff. We're kind of taking it, I think, to extremes sometimes uh, where we keep changing the meters back and forth. But it definitely, for me, stemmed from listening to you know, early Rush and the right. way they would do things. Most of the times, I think the way that it goes down is, you're right, we'll write a riff. And I mean, this, this type of riff over here. <laughs> that's just something that kind of comes out. You know, we need something in F sharp, and there it is. Right. And you're not really thinking about the odd time. But then, uh, again, there is a time where, as we're writing, we'll want to make it more interesting. And then we will start thinking about how to uh, change it even further and, right. and change the time. Right. Uh, we'll say, oh, you know, is this better if it's all in nine, or should it alternate between nine and eight? And then we'll try every different variation yeah. of mutation until we get something that really sounds right to all five members. A lot of times it's, uh, it's a matter of... Um, Co like compromises, you know. Sometimes you have guys. Oh, I, I think it sounds all really good, just all in four, you know. Right. And then another guy will be like, No, it has to alternate. So then we'll. How about at the end when it comes back? Then it'll be, you know. So we do things like that all the time. You kind of get all the different variations in there. As far as uh, playing these type of riffs, um, there's a couple different ways you can feel. It. I mean, one way, or or I should say, you can play it. One way is playing all alternating uh, down, up, down, up, down, up. Right. And with a lot of the odd times, uh, it gets a little confusing because s sometimes you feel everything where the phrase starts on a down, and when it comes back around, it's still on a down. And sometimes when it comes back around, it's on an up. So you have to get used to being able to feel both, you right. know, accenting with up and accenting with down. Right. So um, what I did for a long time in my practicing routine is that anything that I played, uh, with, even if it was just a scale, like a part of a scale or something, I would play it two ways. And this is primarily from listening to Steve Morse. Oh, okay. Yeah, th that's where I got that whole thing. Because he, he's such a technician, he's such an amazing guitar player. If I had to name my favorite guitar player, it would be Steve. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. And uh, I remember either watching him in a clinic or listening to a tape, and he kind of said that, that you should be prepared to be able to play something with down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up the whole time, or up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, and they both feel different. So basically, whatever you practice, do it both ways. From the simplest thing, like a scale fragment. You know. <laughs> practicing that, you know, as a warm-up, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, I started with down, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Then I would play the same thing starting with up. So obviously it sounds the same, but in your head, you can kind of get used to accenting the down and the up. So then when you're playing a riff that requires uh, the meter to be modulating constantly and a, and a constant down, up, down, up, you won't be thrown off right. and you won't be tempted to play double down stroke. Right. Sometimes that sounds cool for certain things if you're trying to make it sound heavy, but if you want that consistent, like, you know, clock type of thing, right. uh, then you, you have to be able to play both ways. That's how I practice. So anything, you know, it, it could be the simplest things, uh, you know, little exercises. <laughs> was all down, up, down, up, down, up, down, mm -hmm. up. Then you would start with up. And it, it sounds exactly the same. I think I drove a lot of people crazy growing up, my family, in my room. Why are you playing the same thing over? And I'd be like, no, I'm not. I'm, it's different. You can't hear it, but it's different to me. If you were playing an arpeggio and alternate picking, um, starting with down and going. You have
have uh, a little problem spot over here where you have to pick inside the string. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that, that accented note, the D, it's like, it's very unnatural to play that with up. And, and there are some people, I've seen other people. And then you have to come back with the down a high, on a higher string. Yeah. So you're traveling right. further right. to come right. back over. Yeah. It kind of doesn't make sense. It's a lot easier to play that if you're starting with a down on the lower string. <laughs> Pick direction is right, and then, and then in those cases, then you start to do pull-offs and stuff to make it a little bit easier. And that feels the most natural to me. There's nothing weird about it. So I guess the point is, with someone like like Steve Morris, he can do that stuff so well, he sort of never gets stuck. So you have to practice those hard things. They're all like just four-string arpeggios. Playing down, up, down, up, down, up. rhythm underneath it that sets up the melody is the same rhythm that's going beneath the melody. So you can hear it. That's another example of, of trying to make the sound bigger, like I was talking about earlier with what with Rush. Playing that chord, even now. Uh, yeah, I'm letting those notes kind of ring and create, uh, fill up the space, basically. There's yeah, that there's definitely uh, something to be said for changing the tone of the guitar as you're playing. I think that adds to the expression. Right. I, I think that's something that's developed with time, most likely with players. Um, usually, when you hear younger players, even players that have some technical ability, that part where um, the the tone is changing and shaping, uh, it takes a lot of maturity. I think and talk about influences, I think Joe Satriani is a huge influence on me as far as that's concerned. I mean, not only melodically and technically, and, you know, his intonation is just unbelievable, mm -hmm. but changing, he changes the tone as he plays. He uses the wah-wah to do that. Right. He uses where he picks on the string right. to do that. Right. And that that's really a big influence on me as well. Right. Um, I like to play higher melodies on the neck pickup. And, and I think even within playing those higher melodies, if I want a note to sort of scream or get some sort of pinched harmonic, then I'll uh, use the bridge pickup in the middle of a note even. Right, right. Um, it it kind of like 
that has to do with the amp, and you're almost playing the amp. You know, you're mm -hmm. you're letting the gain interact. Also, in in constructing a part like this, um, you, you know, where I think that the melody is interesting. Um, it's not just a straight melody. There are other notes involved where I'm outlining the chords, mm -hmm. so you can hear the chords going by as I'm playing the melody, uh, using open strings and, like you said, you know, glisten. <laughs> That, that's a total Steve Vai thing to me, you know, when I'm kind of constructing th things like that. Mm -hmm. He's like the king of interesting guitar. You know, everything that he comes out with is just, it, it grabs you. It's like, right. wow, I've never heard anybody do that before, you know, right. two measures later. Wow, I've never heard anybody do that before, <laughs> you know, from album to album to album. Right. Um, he continues that, that high level of creativity. Right. And, uh, you know, when I'm thinking about making a part like this, you know, the little pictures of Steve just going through my head. <laughs> This is a riff from Pull Me Under, it's the main riff, mm -hmm. and this is very influenced by Metallica, who is a huge influence not only on me, but on the band. Um, if I try to describe my band to people who haven't really heard us, I say, kind of like a marriage of Yes and Metallica. So it's the instrumentation of Yes with the five members and keyboards and the long songs and things like that, but with more of the sound of Metallica, which is a heavier, guitar sound, have your double bass drumming and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So um, this riff uses uh, a lot of just two note power chords. I'm, I'm not even playing the root in a lot of cases. So if I'm playing, for example, uh, what would be A to G, I only play uh, the fifth and the octave. F sharp to G. Um, There's a part where I have to go C sharp to G, and I play the root fifth. This is very evil. Try some. And the other um, key to playing this type of thing is in the sound of the amp. Uh, you want to try to get, you don't want to have too much distortion because you want the low notes to be very tight. Uh, the way a friend of mine described it, it's like a steel pipe, you know, being uh, smashed against a brick building, <laughs> right? Is it a particularly violent, violent friend of yours? Or no? <laughs> so uh, the the key to doing that is uh, you have to roll off the gain on the amp. Uh, and the way I do that is I, I'll actually sit there and kind of play a note like that with one hand while I'm rolling off the gain. And you can hear when it starts to break up and sound fuzzy, uh, and you, you kind of back it down. The other key to that is also to turn down the bass a little bit, depending on the amp. Mm -hmm. um, some of my amps, some of the older boogies, uh, the bass is like off or on like one or two right, right. to do that, depending on where the bass is in the, um, the gain stage, if it's before or after it makes a difference. Because you want the attack to be right there. Right there, right, yeah. Immediately, not, you got to wait. No, no waiting. This isn't <laughs> like a creamy, flubby thing. Yeah. And the other thing is you have to, of course, mute the strings with your palm. And there's two things about that. One of them is, is putting your palm on the strings to mute. The other is to make your pick um, not 
don't be concerned about hitting all the strings at once. You almost want to scrape it across like you get like that. So you can hear like the deadness of the sound. And uh, this drives our keyboard player, player crazy because he can't tell what note it is. You know, if I'm playing, he's like, is that an F or is that an E? I can't, because the pitch comes up a little bit. All right, so here's the riff. So another thing that I'm doing to uh, change up the tone is to add in pick harmonics, you know, by scraping the pick across the strings and then catching the harmonic with my thumb. And that changes the tone of the chord, where it sounds like you have a wah-wah change in the tone. So, uh, for example, you know, I can just... That's just the pick straight on. It's almost not like a precision part where you're trying to get that clock thing going. This is more you want really solid accents and, and you want to retain the heaviness factor. Right. So yeah, you're right. There are double down picks to accommodate the odd times. <laughs> way to play these types of fast moving metric modulation things is to break them up into smaller bits. So you can think of it like one, two, three, one, two, and then one, two, three, one, two, one, two. One, two, three, one, two. It's hard for me to think of it that way because of where the melody notes are. I almost think of it like where the lower note is a, is a pickup to the melody. Mm -hmm. That's the way I think of it. I don't think it's phrased that way on the drums, but so I'm kind of hearing. That's what I'm hearing in my head. Mm -hmm. And the lower notes, even though they are downbeats, they don't feel like downbeats to me. They feel like pick up the melody. Contrary to what we talked about before with doing the consistent down, up, down, up, down, up, sometimes you want to play double down. Um, and it basically stems from what sounds good. In this case, I want to be able to play the melody notes with an up stroke. And in order to do that, since there are odd times going by, I have to repeat the down. Um, on the basically on the root notes as they're rising. So from the F sharp section. That's a good example of that. Alright, so it serves two purposes. One is the melody note, they're all going to be up. And the second is that those bass notes that are going by are very heavily accented. Whatever they happen to be. And I think it sounds stronger than playing it with an upstroke.
playing a heavy rhythm like that, you wouldn't go. It's not going to sound as heavy. If you, maybe if you were opening it. And in that case, those double downs make it sound heavier. Five, five, seven, five, seven, five, five, seven. Can't say it as I play it. <laughs> <laughs>